Welcome to this year's first IMA public lecture. This year we're given on the travel and cell phone problem by William Cook. Bill Cook is the Russ and Sammy Chandler Chair in Industrial and Systems Engineering in Georgia Tech. That's a position he's held up, held up for a couple of months. He, before that, he was the Noah Harding Professor of Computational and Applied Math at Rice, and he got there by way of a couple of years in Princeton as well. He was the director of the Keck Center for Computational and Discrete Optimization at Rice. He also spent six years in industry, so he's been both an academic mathematician and an industrial mathematician. He worked at Bellicor. He had degrees in mathematics, operations, research, and combinatorics and optimization. That was his PhD at the University of Waterloo. He's the editor of chief of the Journal of Mathematical Programming and uh, the co author of a famous book on uh, combinatorial optimization. Some of his co authors are sitting here nodding their heads. Uh, <laughs> he won the Bill Orchard Hayes Prize for the computational work associated with the traveling salesman problem with uh, three co-recipients, and I think several of them are in the audience too, so we could have an autograph session at the end with all these famous people here. Uh, <clears throat> the idea of the IMA Public Lecture Series is to try to convey some of the excitement and also some of the significance of contemporary mathematical research. One of the professional liabilities if you're a mathematician like I am is uh, that you were saying a party, someone asks you what you do, and you say you're a mathematician, and it's a conversation stopper. Stop the day. <laughs> the typical responses you get are things like, you mean you do research in mathematics, so you, you can multiply fractions really fast, I guess. <laughs> and few people understand that actually the great majority of mathematics that exists was invented in this century. There's a tremendous amount of activity in mathematics research. It can be very technical and daunting. One of the things that makes mathematics more approachable for people who aren't technically trained in it is that occasionally there are problems that are very, very simple to state, very clear to state, and which are very, very hard and lead to very, very good mathematics. The most famous is probably Fermat's last theorem, which I'm sure everybody heard about. Uh, sounds like the kind of thing you could work on on the bus, but it took a few centuries to figure it out. The traffic salesman problem is in that line. It's something that's simple to state. There's many variants, but you can get the idea quickly. Very, very hard to solve. Very, very hard to solve efficiently. If you can really solve it efficiently, there's a million dollar prize out there. But it has another aspect to it that a lot of the um, pro other problems don't have, and that is it's very, very relevant in all sorts of areas. So problem sell traveling salesman problem is probably not used so much to plan the routes of traveling salesmen because not many of them go to 15,000 cities. But it is used to plan the routes of, for example, drill presses moving over, uh, uh, over computer chips and uh, robotic tools of various sorts. But it's also used in other applications as, as different as genomics and even archaeology to get the uh, correct uh, timing and spacing between graves. I don't know if Bill will mention that application, but Travis has been used there. And so it's a wonderful thing. It's deep mathematics, exciting mathematics, and also important. That's exactly what the Institute of Mathematics and its application, which I'm the director of and which is hosting this, that's what we're about. We're a, an institute that exists to try to bring together high quality mathematics research with important problems. And so I'm very glad to be able to uh, move that agenda along today with Bill Cook. Thanks, Doug. Can you hear me? Yeah. It certainly is a pleasure to be able to speak here at the IMA. The topic of my talk is the traveling salesman problem. Now, that's certainly a snappy name for a topic in mathematics. And it's not just a name that's nice. The problem itself is, is very appealing, very seductive. You have a salesman wakes up in the morning, and he or she needs to visit a list of customers, list of clients, and wants to drive the least number of miles before returning home. So in other words, you have a specified set of cities, and you want to find the shortest possible route to visit all the cities and return to your starting point. You know, it's, it's something that all occurs in our daily lives, when we're trying to organize some chores or to pick up some people. And it's, even though it's so simple, it's had a profound influence in the field of optimization, and discrete optimization in, in particular. There have been important contributions to the traveling salesman problem have been made by people in a wide variety of areas, mathematicians, computer scientists, 
operations researchers, physicists, biologists, chemists. It's even attracted the attention of artists. See, uh, see this beautiful painting is by a New York painter, Julian Lethbridge. I, I found it just by accident by browsing through some online galleries uh, a year ago. And see, it's titled Traveling Salesman, and it's clearly a route of a salesman would take through, well, it's a couple hundred points there in the square. When I saw it, I, I was really curious what motivated the artist to, to paint a tour like that. So I made some effort and finally got in contact with him. And what he said is that he'd been looking through a popular journal and came across an article on the TSP and was struck by the economy of space that good tours provide. See, this, this tour is a nice tour and has a property that every nice tour would have in that it doesn't cross itself. But it, if a tour crosses itself, then you could remove those two links, those two roads, and then reconnect up the two, two paths that remain and end up getting a shorter tour. So if a tour doesn't cross itself, then it's a closed curve, sort of like a rubber band that you would put on, on a stretch around and put on a table. So it has an inside and outside. And Lethbridge has a nice way of visualizing that space and that he shades the inner side of the curve differently than the outer side. It's really nice and that's an important, important thing in, in mathematics that we have prob problems that have some nice aesthetics. But in mathematics and in optimization in particular, a problem will really only catch on and, and stay important for a long time if there's some really nice interaction between applications areas outside of mathematics and the mathematic theory itself. And the TSP certainly has this, as, as Doug had mentioned, several applications. I'll, I'll go over a number of them as well. Now, certainly there's a natural problem of a salesman running around visiting people or you know, it's more likely to be a van or a truck that tries to pick up people or items and take them to a depot or perhaps to an airport. Now, my, the first application is, is of that type. Now, Honest Abe was neither a salesman nor a van driver, but he was a lawyer. And he worked as a circuit court lawyer with Judge Davis that they, Judge Davis and Lincoln and their entourage would go from county to county in Illinois and hear the cases that hadn't been heard since the last time they visited. Now this is the route that Lincoln took in 1850. And see, it's a pretty good tour. Well, that's not a bad tour, but you start thinking, well, it's probably not the optimal tour. If you, once you see this acute angle there, you think there's probably something wrong. Probably you could do this in a shorter way. And indeed, the optimal tour is about 10% less than the value of Lincoln's tour. That's ah, probably not much, but travel in those days isn't the same as it is today. It's not like they had an SUV with a DVD player and, and uh, they could drive around. And so you have to wonder that if they were using this better tour, maybe Lincoln's life as a lawyer would have been just that little bit better that he wouldn't have switched prof professions later on. <laughs> and so, I mean, if you carry that train, train, train of thought further, then you might think, well, I probably would have needed a visa to come up from Atlanta to, to give this lecture today in Minneapolis. Um, so this is a couple hundred years ago, and clearly people were worried about getting their tours, but you can go much further back in history than that. And in honor of the Twin Cities, I searched around the internet and found a tour of St. Paul. The, uh, I got this from a PBS site that he made through the Aegean Sea. Now, there, there's nothing to complain at all about Paul's tour. It's really nice. Now, you have to realize what modes of transportation he had. When he went and visited the Corinthians, he actually backtracked right back the same path again. Probably should have taken a boat over, but I know, probably didn't have something available. Um, so, there's problems of this type. There's logistics problems where you're running around, say, you might have uh, somebody going around fixing your telephones. Right, and they have a certain number of customers that need to visit that day and drive around. Now, a lot of those problems in logistics would have some sort of other condition on them, like with the telephone repairman, they say, you normally say, well, you should be there between 10 and, well, you don't say it, they tell you to be home between 10 and 12, <laughs> and then they plow out the route to make sure the salesman is there at that time. But there's other problems in logistics that aren't just of that nature, of picking up people or driving a van around. You often try, you have to move other types of equipment. And a uh, problem that's of historical importance to the TSP is this work by, that was done by, it's a renowned statistician from India, India Mahalanopoulos. He, he was faced with the following problem, that they were, it's a, he was, it was from Bengal, and they're growing jute. Jute is this plant here. It's, you make burlap 
type things out of it. Um, they wanted to do uh, a survey of their soil. So they wanted to, they picked random spots in Bengal and were going to sample the soil in those spots. And they quickly found out that the major cost was not in doing the sampling itself, but in transporting the people and equipment from place to place. So then it was just a traveling salesman problem to figure out what order should they take the samples. Now, an interesting thing is you would have thought that what they, were in, what they would study with recipes or algorithms for trying to find a good tour, short tour. But that's not what Mahalapas studied. He's a statistician, so he studied the distribution of the lengths of tours, the lengths of, of good tours through the points. Now, there was a similar study that was made in the U.S. about two years after that, in, in the early 40s, that was uh, talk, uh, dealing with cornfields in Iowa. So there might have been some argument for calling this the traveling farmer's problem rather than the traveling salesman problem. But just to give a little bit of balance, uh, so the next application, which I represent by the Captain Crunch, uh, is uh, one that I read about in the New York Times about six months ago on, on online grocery stores. Like, oh, this, is, this was an application from England, but we have online grocery stores here. The other day I was walking around, I saw a big billboard uh, in town that said, I spent all my week working, I'm not going to spend my Saturday in the grocery store. So as an alternative, what they're saying is you should type in your list of groceries into your computer, and then somebody will show up in your doorstep for a few hours later with bags and give them to you. Now, in England, this is a very competitive field. What they're doing is not taking up warehouses with their own supplies, but they're just using local grocery stores. And in order to save costs, they're using TSP software to route their employees through the grocery stores to fill your order. <laughs> right? So it's a nice uh, little TSP. So these logistics type applications are just natural cases of the TSP. But there's other problems that aren't, aren't of that type, aren't really somehow seemingly to be a traveling salesman running around. I'll mention a couple of them. One important one is in telecommunications. Right? We, we all know how to use a telephone. You pick it up and, and you get a dial tone. You dial a number, punch a number, and it goes off to your, whoever wants to speak to. And then you start speaking to them. But what happens in between is that call gets routed along a network from switch to switch and finally gets to its destination. Now, one thing that's happened over the past 10 years or so is that the tele telecommunication networks are now much more reliable. You very seldom will get the reply to saying, well, your call can't be uh, connected. Well, unless you forgot to dial the one or you did dial the one when you shouldn't have dialed the one. Um, and one way they're doing this is by building in reliability into the network. So rather than just having a single path from your phone to the phone of the person you want to speak to, they have an alternative route. And one of the ways they built that is by designing components of the networks in, in rings. So if you have a ring connecting central offices, telephone offices, then if one of the links goes down, everyone on the ring can still speak with everyone else. So because, because the traffic can go either one way or the other way. And so once they decide that they want to put a ring through those offices, then it's just a traveling salesman problem to design, to figure out what that ring should actually be. Um, and this is incorporated in, in some software that's sold by the Telcordia Corporation. The TSP software is built into their toolkit. Right, so that's one non, non uh, application that doesn't really have this flavor of a salesman running around. The second one I, I illustrate by the stargazing. It's an application that I like. Uh, it was carried out by a consulting firm in Houston that was working on a contract to NASA. So NASA has planned to send up another space telescope. And this one is going to be a, a pair of satellites that are going to go up in tandem. And what they do is they both aim at the object they want to image, and then based on the interference pattern from the data they collect, they can get a really high quality image of the object. All right, now what they do then, they image that object, and then they spend some fuel to do a maneuver to rotate around so they can image their next object. So the traveling salesman problem is that the cities are the objects they want to image. The distance between the cities is the amount of fuel it takes to rotate around hit them. So once the, once the satellites run out of fuel, the mission's over. So in order to get the biggest bang for their buck, they're using the TSP software to figure out what order they should do the imaging once they go up. All right, the final application I'll, I'll mention is the one to, about genomics that Doug mentioned. Because this, this is one in which there's been some action in the, in the past year. Now, we all know the problems of genome sequence, very important uh, problems now, and mathematics is playing a big role. 
Now, as, as you know from looking at these articles that are often in newspapers, one of the main thing steps in building these genome sequencing sequences is to take data that's collected from various laboratory experiments and use that data to then figure out what order they want to put in the DNA, what order the genome should be in. Now, from the lab experience, experiments, what they get is data on how likely it is that two components, two pairs, are ne near to each other or not near to each other. So to figure out the total ordering, they want to get the most likely one, and that's just a TSP problem, model as a TSP problem. Now, this had been known for a number of years, mainly through work by Richard Karp and his group have modeled this as a TSP. What's happened in the past year, however, is that people are now starting to use this TSP approach. And it's mainly through the work of Argavala and Schaefer at, uh, from the National Institute of Health. What they've done is taken our, our Concord TSP code, and working together with my colleague David Applegate, they've made the interface between our software and the types of data structures that are used in the genetic community. And now various groups are starting to use this software to produce various genomes for different species. All right, so the TSP has a wide variety of applications. So you might argue again, well, why does name traveling salesman problem? Well, I mean, it's a nice name, but it's also that traveling salesmen itself have had an important influence on the development of the problem. If you look in the 1800s and early 1900s, you can find many manuals, sort of guide, help, help manuals for traveling salesmen. And in those manuals, you can see descriptions about how they should go about planning the routes. The most explicit one is this one from Germany from the early 1800s, where they explicitly talk about the problem of finding the most economic route for traveling through, through sets of cities. And for various regions of Germany, they gave proposed routes and proposing these as what they expected to be optimal routes. In some cases they were, in some cases they're not, but they, they were always very good tours. Traveling salesmen, you have to realize that, that traveling salesmen was a big part of the culture in America and Europe and other places at that time. So much so that there, there were board games. That this particular one, Commercial Traveler, was a board game from the late 1800s where people were, the players were asked to find routes through various networks. This was a road network and you see it comes all the way up to St. Paul. That's why I like to think. Um, and this isn't the only game that appeared. Much later game that was sent to everyone's home in America was the following ad that was put out by Procter, Gam Procter & Gamble in the early 60s. And this was a contest. I mean, it was a contest and it was trying to sell products. That's what this little piece of glue in the middle was. It had some coupons stuck to it for soap uh, products. And this is a problem where they were trying to find the shortest route. There's 33 cities there. And the contest was whoever could find the shortest route was going to win $10,000, a substantial prize in that, at that time. You could buy a house at, at that point in time for, for that much money. Now, this contest has had an influence on mathematics. It, David Applegate and I uh, found this, uh, about this by looking at some old papers. And one of, them, one of the papers, mathematics papers, mentioned part of the popularity of the TSP arose from a soap uh, contest that was run. And so based on that, we figured, well, it had to be Procter & Gamble. And at the time, David, well, he's still working for AT&T. He worked at AT&T, then left and worked at AT&T again. David was at AT&T, and so he phoned his, got on his phone and said he was corporate AT&T, and he wanted to speak with corporate Procter & Gamble. Then, without hanging up the phone, he got passed from person to person, and finally got somebody in the office to look through a folder and found this copy. And then they, David said, well, could we have a copy? And he said, well, we got two of them. So they actually sent us an original one. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it had to, another thing in the, is that the winner was a mathematician as well. Gerald Thompson works at Carnegie Mellon. He had found, a number of people had found what turned out to be the optimal tour. Although they didn't know it was the optimal tour. They just knew that was the best tour that they could find. And then he won in a, a tie-breaking contest about writing an essay about why you like soap. And he was able to do that. Um. So you have these wide uh, sources of applications. So it's not surprising that it finally worked its way in the mathematics community. And it did that in, mainly in the middle of the last century through the work uh, of three wise men, uh, Carl Menger, Hassler Whitney, and Merle Flood. The, the sequence of events seems to be the following. That Menger was running a mathematics colloquium in Vienna. 
And as part of the colloquium, he, they would do recordings of any uh, important events. And if you look back, what is recorded in 1930 is an explicit statement of the traveling salesman problem, a, a geometric version where you have points in space and you're looking through a curve for the, through them, the shortest possible curve. All right, now, we also knew that Hassler Whitney was giving lectures on the TSP in Princeton. And, but the only real connection we had between the two were the dates. That seemed likely that somehow Menger must have somehow gotten in contact with Whitney, but we didn't really know. But in the past year, there's now been a direct connection was established by Lex Scriver, who is a, a Dutch mathematician who is an outstanding researcher, but he's also now perhaps the best historian in the field of optimization, uh, mathematical optimization. And what he was able to establish is that Menger went to Harvard University for a longer visit at the end of 1930. And at that time, uh, Whitney was at Harvard. And you know, he's found recordings in the archives at Harvard that the two of them took part in seminars together and discussed in details problems in discrete mathematics. Now, we don't know for sure that he passed on, that Menger passed on his enthusiasm for the traveling salesman problem, but it seems very likely to be the case. But we know it's two years later that Whitney is now at Princeton and giving regular seminars on this problem. And one of the people in the audience is Merle Flood. Now, Merle Flood is a, an important figure in early optimization in, in the U.S. If you're familiar with game theory, you know the problem of the prisoner's dilemma. That's due to Merle Flood. So he's an important person, and he really was enthusiastic about Whitney's problem. And he later went on to apply it to some school bus routing applications in New Jersey and then in West Virginia. And he quickly became the champion of the TSP, promoting it at Princeton and later at the Rand Corporation, which was a big center for optimization economics in the United States after World War II. All right, so at this point, you have all these applications just sitting around there, or some of them are pure TSP or TSP-like applications all sitting there. You have three very prominent mathematicians pushing it. It was not a surprise that the TSP was ready to take off in, in prominence, and indeed it has. At this date, there's hundreds and hundreds of papers on the TSP. Now, my own work on the traveling salesman problem goes back to around 1988, and I've had the fortune to be able to work with three modern wise men, David Applegate, Robert Bixby, and Vashik Kvatel. Uh, two are here today. The uh, Vashik is not here today. Well, you would notice if, well, actually, that, that's a somewhat out of date picture of Vashik. He's, um, <laughs> as you'll see if he arrive, when he arrives tomorrow morning, if you see him. Um, this sort of a funky background I have from my colleagues is a tribute to, to Lethbridge, although you can't really see it at that scale. That's a million city traveling salesman problem drawn in the manner of Lethbridge. I'm shading the tour. So to see that, I'm going to blow up that area, that little square. And you can see that it looks similar to, to Lethbridge. Not nearly as nice, but it looks similar to Lethbridge's painting. That tour, in fact, is a good tour. It's a tour that I know is within under a tenth of a percent away from optimal, even though it's from a million cities. And this particular problem was proposed by David Johnson from AT&T. It's just a million points, random points, scattered around in the square. And that's, that's why the tour sort of looks like a fractal-like uh, like object. But this is a, Lethbridge's idea is a nice way of visualizing tours. And here I'll show you the shape of, of four of the tours that my colleagues and I have computed with our, our Concord TSP code. Uh, the, the first one is uh, some nearly 12,000 points that came from a circuit board, one of these problems where you're trying to drill holes in the circuits. The other three are geometric problems. This 13,000 city problem is all the cities in the U.S. that had at least 500 people, uh, continental U.S. This was some 15,000 cities in Germany, and this is some nearly 17,000 cities in Italy. Now, three of those tours are really special in that they are the best possible tour through, that, through those points. They're just, no, it's not that they're the best tour we could find, there just isn't any better tour. They're the optimal tour. The fourth one, we're not really sure whether it's optimal or not, but if you spot a flaw in it, you'd have to have really good eyes. This tour through Italy, we don't know whether it's optimal or not, but we do know that it's really, really close to being the best possible tour. Right? In, in, the, in the units that these are just some uh, strange units that they have in the distance function for the problem. But it's the tour has length 557315. And I know that there's no tour of length better than 557308. Right? I just know that there's nothing better than that. So I don't know I'm the best possible tour, but I know that we're damn close 
to the best possible tour. And what, how I'd like to structure now the, the more technical part of my talk is to describe the methods we use to obtain these, to obtain these values. All right, so it's really two different things. One is to find a good tour, and the second one is to find some certificate that says that, well, you're either the best possible tour, at least there's no tour better than this value. So it's like a performance guarantee. I know that there's nothing better than this. So I'll start with how we found that tour, because that's more, the more intuitive uh, topic. All right, let me do a little example. Now, the, it turns out that the best way for finding tours is something that's intuitive that everyone would, would discover for themselves. If, if I had thought ahead and printed up some papers, say uh, some 50 cities, and I passed them out and said I was going to leave, and 10 minutes later I was going to give 100 bucks to whoever has the best tour. Well, those of you who are thinking, well, there's a lot of ways you might construct a tour, but those of you who are thinking ahead, you're probably going to use a pencil and, and not a pen. Because once you make the tour, you're going to see little things that you could correct and make it a little bit shorter. And you would like to be able to do that. Like, for example, Link, at Lincoln's tour, where I said that, well, there's some problem with this acute angle. Well, suppose I deleted those two links that were in that acute angle. Then I decide, well, let's delete that third link as well. But if I place those three links by the three black ones, I end up with a shorter tour. And that's known as a three swap. That I take three links and I replace them with three links and I end up with something better. Now, it's natural also to think, well, what about a two swap? Or a four swap? Five swap? K swap? Um, well, the, and there's a very ingenious algorithm due to Lin and Kernighan, Shen Lin and Brian Kernighan from the late 70s that devised a very nice way for looking for such, such types of improvements. But they look around, they, they spot a flaw in the tour, and then they correct it. And the method they use to spot it is that they look for sequences of two swaps and sometimes three swaps. It looks for a sequence of them such that if you apply the whole sequence, you end up with a better tour. Somewhere in the middle, you might be slightly worse, but then they keep putting more and more two and three swaps on until finally they get down to what they hope is going to end up being a better tour. If after a while they decide, well, this is not leading anywhere, then they throw them away and, and search over again. They have a mechanism for doing that. Our, these type of algorithms of looking for flaws and, and correcting them are known as hill climbing methods. Right? And it's a nice metaphor to, for visualizing it. But you think of the landscapes of all the possible solutions of the TSB. All the tours are just sitting here. And I raise them up according to their quality. The best tours I make the highest. Right? And so then these algorithms where you're looking for a flaw and correcting it, they can be thought of as, as going up a hill. So you have some tour and you're looking for a step to take you up the hill to find a better tour. And eventually you get up to the peak of the hill you're at and then you can't go anymore. There's no two or no K swap that, that can possibly make you better. All right, but that's not really what we want. We want to eventually get a really high tour, not just high in just some little peak. Like if you're mountain climbing, you want to get the top of, uh, this is Gasher Brom 4. You don't want to be on top of one of its lesser brethren. Um, and so, there's various ways that have been proposed for trying to uh, correct this fact that all you do is walk up a local hill. The most common method is one that's known as multiple start heuristics. It's a method that was proposed by Lynn and Kernighan. It's just simple that if you want to try to find a big, get up to the top of a big mountain, well just then start from a, many different spots. So just randomly pick spots and climb to the mountain that you're near to. And if you pick enough spots, you hope that you start from somewhere near to a big mountain. Right, that's, that's a simple, simple idea. But there's a lot of research that's gone in to try and prove this. And the TSP has normally been the uh, sort of the battle line where people are first trying to, to they both propose their ideas and demonstrate their usefulness. But this type of research is now applied to wide varieties of problems. Uh, one of the successful methods is simulated annealing that appeared uh, on the TSP in Scientific American uh, quite a number of years ago now. And it could be viewed as a physical, there's a physical way of viewing it, a sort of a material that then cools down, is moving around and cools down and eventually settles down. You can also think of it just in terms of the hill climbing, that rather than always walking up the mountain, every now and again you're allowed to take a step down. So you're allowed to do one of these swaps that actually makes your tour a little bit worse. But you don't always go down. You just go down with a certain probability. You flip some coins and decide, well, where I really should go down. And the probability de 
depends on how far down it will take you. If it's taking you all the way down to the foot of the mountain, well, then you're not going to do it. It's very low probability that you do it. But if it takes you down, down a little ways, then maybe you will do it. And what the algorithm does is during the course of the algorithm, it lowers these probabilities. So in the beginning, you can bounce around, but after a while, you get stuck that you hope into a high range, and then you won't ever leave that range, just bounce around on top of that range. And it, it's worked nicely in, a, in a, quite a number of areas. Another general idea is called chain local search. That was proposed by two physicists, uh, Martin and Otto, in the early 90s, right around 1990. Their idea is, is simple. That Think about this, this the Lin Kearney, this multiple start heuristic. Like think what happened. So I, here and I actually climb up on top of Gasher Brum floor. It's my local optimal tour. And then I say, well, I still want to find someplace higher if I, possible. So I take a random point. The random point happens to be in the Dead Sea. Well, you're not going to get any, any better tour if you climb around hills in the Dead Sea. And so what they suggest is that you should work a lot harder once you get up to a good peak. And what they propose is once you get up to the top of a peak, rather than starting over again, you should perturb your solution. They call it kicking. So you should kick your tour. How they do it is by a couple of random two swaps you, of a certain type. You kick your tour. Hopefully it knocks you off your current mountain. And then you use the hill climbing to walk up to the mountain next to you. Right? And now if you end up with up the new mountain you climb happens to be higher than your current one, well then you use it. You start from that point. Otherwise you go back to the original one. And this, me this method just beats the pants off this idea of doing multiple start heuristics. I'll give you an idea with, with some modern implementations about how it works. Now this test I made were over a sequence of a library of problems, about a hundred problems ranging in size from a few cities up to nearly a hundred thousand cities. And it's a library it's called TSPlib. It's maintained by a German mathematician, Gerd Reinhardt. And they, they come from various sources, from geometric problems and industrial sources. And what I did in, is to run uh, the, our Concord implementation of the chained version of Lynn Kernighan's algorithm. And I ran it until I obtained tours that were within 1% of optimality. So 1% within the, the certificates that were known for those problems. And then I marked down the running time on the log-log scale. And see, in all instances, it found such a tour of 1% quality in under 10 seconds. And if you look down to, say, around 500 cities, it's always in a tenth of a second. And this is under a workstation now that costs four or $500 to put together, just a PC. All right, now, if you wanted to do better than that, get 0.1% optimal, well, if you invest more time, you can apply Kelt Helskin's new version of the Lynn Kernighan heuristic. You, under the same conditions, just in a couple of hours, he's able to get within 0.1% of all those stories. They had a single failure, but in general, he could do this. Now, uh, notice that I didn't include the two biggest problems. It's not because he couldn't do it. Indeed, it looks very much like he's just going up on a, on a nice line, going right up towards those problems. But the balance for those, the certificates of quality for those very big problems is such that it's very difficult indeed to, to get uh, such a good solution. So this is very impressive work. And indeed, for a lot of applications where your data is not perfect, such a good solution within 0.1% of optimal is certainly all you need. But there are a few caveats there. One is that this library is dominated by geometric problems. Problems where you have points in space and you're running around it, where we've seen a number of the applications aren't of that type. A second caveat is that in a lot of times you have applications, you have some side condition, like what for, for the repairman where you need to visit at a certain time, certain time windows. So they're always TSP-like problems, but these results are for the pure TSP, not for these ones with extra conditions on. A third caveat is, is that sometimes you actually want to get even a better quality solution than this. Now, the genome is, is an example of that. Even though the data for that genome sequencing problems isn't all that good, it's laboratory data, has errors in it, but it's a very competitive field. So these people are coming out with their paper and saying, this is the mouse genome. Well, if somebody else comes in with another sequence that, that's better on their measure of likelihood, well, then which one do you accept? And so it's, it's quite competitive. And so they've often, in some of the papers, are now running and getting the optimal solution to our code rather than just getting a, a heuristic-based solution. All right, then there's another time when you want to find the optimal solutions, and that's when you're doing something like us. We want to solve the traveling salesman problem. 
which means we want to get the best possible solution, not just approximate it, we want to actually get the best one. All right, so what would you do? Well, the first thought is that, well, take this chain Lynn Kernighan, this Hellskin version of, of Lynn Kernighan, and do the multiple start method. Just apply it a number of times and take your best solution. This is a very common approach in, in applying heuristic algorithms. But it's not a very good approach. Right? Think about what happens for the TSP. You're generating this big family of tours. You're working really hard to generate these tours, and then you take the best one and throw all the other ones away. You just wasted all that work. But Paul Seymour, who's a mathematician from Princeton University, and I proposed now for a number of years, is an alternative. That rather than tossing away all those tours and just taking the best one, we propose to take the tours and try to find the best combination of the tours to get some super tour, some super child of the other ones that has all the best properties. Right, it's sort of like a genetic algorithm, but it's, it's like genetic engineering, where I'm getting the best possible child from, from the uh, pool of parents. Now, how would you do that? Well, I want the best possible child. What you do is you can take your tours, take the links in your tours, and take them one on top of the other. And so then now I get a network with just all the links that happen to be in one of my tour and uh, tours. And then I want to solve the traveling salesman problem restricted to those links. Right. That itself is, seems like not an easy problem, but if your tours are very good tours by themselves, then they're going to share a lot of links in common. And so this final network you get is not going to have all that many links in it. And if it doesn't have any links, then it's subject to be attacked with a theory of graphs that's due to Neil Robertson from Ohio State and Paul Seymour uh, from Princeton. They have a beautiful theory of these type of sparse graphs, they're called, that came up in their proof of the Wagner conjecture, which is one of the great theorems in, in discrete mathematics. Uh, over the past hundred years, or, or forever. I mean, it's just a really beautiful theorem that, they, uh, that they've used. And it's an instance where they were, just, they were just seeking to prove this purely theoretical result, but it has as a consequence the fact that we can solve optimization problems on these sparse graphs now. And so that's what we do. Seymour and I have a code that solves the TSP restricted to these sparse graphs, and so we can get these best possible children of the, of the family of tours. Now, to, to illustrate how this works nicely with, with Keld Helskin's algorithm, I ran on a test of five of the largest problems from the, this TSP lib collection, that, for which we know optimal solutions. And in four of the case, this, this method found the optimal solution. First, by finding 40 of Helskin's tours and then merging them. And just a modest amount of time to do the merging. All right, and that's how we found the Ital Italian tour. Now, I didn't do, this time I was really interested in finding the optimal tour if I could. So I didn't merge just 40 tours, we merged 80 tours. Now, finding these 80 tours takes a long time. This took some 52 days. Um, but of course, it can be done in parallel, right? They, these are all being done independently, these random starts. And so I had 40 machines at, at Rice University, and I just ran them over two days to, to find those tours. Now, the best of those tours is already really good. I mean, it's within now, now 60 of that lower bound that I have, that, that quality guarantee. But in five minutes, you can merge them together and get the tour that I presented. It's the tour that's up here. It's only within seven of the optimal. Actually, I'm, I'm lying. I made these slides, I printed this, this slide about the optimal, the value, this, this 303, this number 308, is actually 310 by now. It's still running on, on some, well, I'll tell you later, it's running on about 80 computers uh, scattered around the US. Um, but I still don't know that that's the optimal tour. But I do know that this is darn close to optimal. <coughs> All right, so now I want to talk about how we know it's darn close. All right, this is the other half of, of, of the problem. Now this half isn't so intuitive. Right? I, mean, I think we all would have ideas. If I gave you some big problem, you all immediately would start coming up with ideas for getting a tour. But to come up with ideas of how to get these certificates, it's a bit, that's a bit more elusive. That's, that's, that's a bit trickier to think of how to do that. But there's been a number of methods that have been proposed over the years. But one of the techniques just stands head and shoulders over all the others. And in, indeed, it was the earliest method that was proposed. It's known as the cutting plane algorithm. This was posed by three very well-known people in operations research, applied mathematics. George Danzig, Ray Fulkerson, and Selmer Johnson. George Danzig might be familiar to a lot of you. He's the father of linear programming, which is a very, very important tool in optimization theory and optimization practice as well. And this method they proposed was in the, in the early 50s. Now, linear programming, some of you will know what that is, but 
the way to, a way to think about it without giving any technical explanation is that you, if you had a box in space, so a nice box that doesn't have any vents in it, but has, it might have many sides. So it might you know, look like a stop sign in a plane or a many-sided box in space. What you can do with linear programming is optimize a linear function. So some plane, you can push it as far as possible and, and still stay inside the box. So you can optimize some linear function over a box. You can find the best possible point inside of a box. But what, how does that help us solve the TSP? Um, well, you can sort of model that as that type of problem. So rather than, than thinking the tour as just, say, the, uh, an itinerary, like you would get from you know, planning a trip, think of a tour in this following unusual way. And think of it as the roads that I use. So what links do I use? So I'm going to get a big 0, 1 vector, where I have a 0 if I don't use the link, and a 1 if I do use the link. Right? So I get this big sequence of zeros and 1s. All right, so just like on a piece of paper where you're plotting, you can just plot in terms of x and y. If you have a whole bunch of coordinates, you can plot it in some big, big space. But it's unimaginably high space. For the Italian problem, it's up in 150 million dimensions. Right? I mean, you have, because you have the, a coordinate for every possible link. All right, but then there's just zero, one vector sitting there. And now to find the shortest tour means to, to have this linear function and optimize it over those zero, one vectors. Now, those zero, one vectors aren't a box. That's not what linear programming can do. So I really haven't done anything to help me solve the problem. I've just restated it in this obscure way. But what Danzig, Folkson, and Johnson do is, well, let's just take a box. Let's just take a box that contains all these things that I like. So all the tours. And then they use linear programming to optimize over the box. All right, now what does that give them? Well, they take this best point in the box. If it happens to be a tour, then they're done. Because this is the best point in the whole box. The box contains all the tours. So if this best point is a tour, it's got to be the best tour. All right, but suppose that's not the case. Well, they still get something. They look at the value of that best point. That has to be at least as good as the value of any tour. And this is that guarantee that, that I've been talking about. This guarantee, this 308, that's how it's obtained. You optimize this linear function over your box, the best point, since the box contains all the tours, the best point has to be at least as good as all the tours. All right, so now, but then you realize, well, what is this quality guarantee I'm going to get? It's going to depend on the shape of the box. Right? If I get this big, really big box, then I'm going to get a really good point, but that's going to be far away from the best possible tour. So it's not, that's going to be a really good point, one that's really short. And so it's not going to be 308, it's going to be some 400,000 or something, something really bad. So you want to get a box that gives you a good approximation of your points. Indeed, if you thought of this box sort of, of wrapping around these points, you can see that there's a best possible box. Right? There's a smallest possible box. So that all the corners of the box are these points that I'm interested in. There's the best possible box. Now, if I optimize my function over that box, that would indeed give me a tour, and I would be done. All right, and indeed, that would be the, if you just wanted to apply linear programming to the traveling salesman problem, that's how you would do it, get your best possible box. But a little bit before Dancy Foxton and Johnson, Harold Kuhn from Princeton showed that, well, that approach isn't going to work. And the way he showed it is by showing all well, this box is too darn complicated. It's just got too many sides to it. You can't possibly write it down. It's, it's way, way too complicated. But when he was presenting these results in the early 50s, he gave a lecture and, and Danzig, Folks, and Johnson are sitting next to each other and then they start nud, nudging each other saying, no, no, that's not how you, should, how you should approach this method. That's not what you need to do. You don't care about the whole box. Right? Just think of it. You're optimizing way up here. I'm trying to find the best point way here. What do I care what the box looks like down here? I just care about where it looks like up where I'm at. All right, so they devised the method for just generating part of the box that they need. The idea is as follows, that you have this good point here, and all your bad points are there. Well, from geometric reasoning, you can see that there's some plane, so some board that you could put such that your point, the optimal point's on one side, and all the tours are on the other side. So then you add that to a box, a new side to your box. And now, you optimize over the box again, well, that old point can't be, it can no longer be the best point because it's not in there. And so your bound has to get better. This, you've got a better now approximation to the tours. This is, known, this is known as the cutting plane algorithm. And it's applied to, not only to the TSP, it's applied to a wide range of algorithms. It's a bread and butter algorithm for solving these types of problems that come up in many industries. 
these ones where you're just trying to optimize over a set of points. All right, now, there's been a lot of research into developing methods for implementing and discovering new, I mean, yeah, one thing is, well, what are good boards to take? What are good cutting planes to use? Well, a natural choice that's come up is that, well, you might as well choose cutting planes that are sides of this box, this best possible box. Right? I mean, there's no sense choosing a plane right here. You might as well push it in until at least it hits some of your tours. And you can make some geometric arguments about why taking cutting planes sides of this best possible box. And so it leads to a natural mathematical question. Well, what does this best possible box look like? But we don't know. And unless somebody's going to win a, a million dollars, probably we'll, we'll never know. And unless somebody wins this million dollar prize that, that Doug mentioned for, for getting a good method for solving over the TSP. But we do know lots of information about that. This has been studied by, well, started with Harold Kuhn, but it's been studied by uh, Martin Grocho, Manfred Padberg, Bill Pulleyblank, who's here, Denis Dadef, who's here, Giovanni Rinaldi, many people from uh, all parts of the world have, have contributed to information about what this best possible box looks like. And an equal number of people have devised methods for looking at this best possible box. And that's one of the main things that my colleagues and I have tried to work on, is ways of automatically detecting. See, it's not just that I know this best possible box, I have to generate the side that I need to cut off my point. Okay. Now, that can get you a really good bound. And in the case of the uh, Italian problem, this got us a bound that wasn't 308, it was around 557280. It's pretty good. But we push it up a bit further. And the way we did that is by a standard method that's known as branch and cut. All right, after a while, you keep adding to your box more and more sides. And eventually, you're adding sides that are very close to one another. So your bound's not getting much better. So at that point, you sort of backtrack and say, well, I've got to do something different. And the thing that's done is to split your set of solutions, your set of tours, into two sets. So for Italy, you might split them this way, that you pick the link from Parma to Bologna, and you say, well, I'm definitely going to use that link. There are some tours that definitely use it. And there's another set of tours that definitely don't use it. So I partition my tours into two sets, and I can reapply this cutting plane, this box method, to each of them independently. And if I chose well, then these two sets have more structure than the original set, and so then I can get a better bound. Right, and then you can do this recursively. You've split it once and you split it again. And for Italy, well, we split it like that 10,000 times. Um, this this the way of looking at the way of splitting is, is due to our colleague David Applegate that what we've done here is to, so I have a, a, a set of solutions and I split it into two. So I get two children of it. And I, the height of the node corresponds to the bound it gives. So the better bounds are down low. So like what I'd like to do is see a node that I split into two and it sends both children downwards. And the coloring are the green ones are ones that we've already split in two again. And these other colored ones are ones that we haven't yet split. So that's why the bound is down to 308. We push things down that far. And I think in another couple of weeks we'll actually solve this problem. I wanted to have it solved by this time, but this for this lecture, but these trees take a while to generate. You can imagine I'm doing this complicated Dancing Folks and Johnson thing for 10,000 uh, sub-problems. Indeed, this, this run has taken 4.6 years. <laughs> well, yeah, you might say, well, how long have, in advance does the IMA plan on these lectures that I could be <laughs> doing that? Well, no, they don't. They, this this 4.6 years is if you ran it on a single machine, but there's no reason for doing that. I mean, especially in this part, once you start splitting up, these can be done at the same time, just with some communication going back and forth, sharing some information. And we set up such a network. Now, the way to get vast computing uh, time these days is to use the internet, like grid computing. You have all these computers scattered around. And so we did just that. We set up a network from Rice University, Princeton's math department, and a server at AT&T. And if you like this kind of nerdy stuff, it's kind of fun watching. And we have these solutions to the linear programming problem we find in, in Texas, and we send them all, all the way over to New Jersey, and we use that then to find more, more linear programming solvers and, and send these cutting planes back over to Texas again. I mean, it's really nice. And this type of TSP has been used as a, a standard model for 
trying to develop techniques to use these types of, of grid methods, big computing methods. And there's been some other problems uh, that have also been adopted, uh, have adopted this type of approach. Indeed, there's even now some general frameworks to try to make it easy to do. This is, takes a little bit of work to set this up, um, including one by Ted Rouse and Lazi Ladnai, who uh, uh, Ladnai is, is here for visiting this uh, MIA this week. Right, now, let me finally turn to sort of the show and tell part of the TSP, and that is the the largest non-trivial size. So, of course, everyone can solve a TSP if, if they were just like the uh, going around the clock. The cities were all around in a circle, and any of us could solve them. So these record problems are typically come from a library, this library that Gert Reinhold has specified. So they're, they're non-trivial problems. And I plotted it on a log scale from the year it was solved by the number of cities, which is one natural measure of the difficulty of a problem. So it goes from the 49th city problem of Danzig, Folkson, and Johnson up to our 15,000 city problem of the cities through Germany that we solved uh, last year. Now, your first qu uh, natural question is, will this continue? Right? Uh, will somebody some years from now give, giving a lecture where we're talking and solving much, much larger problems? Well, to be more precise, if we look from Martin Grochel solved a 120 city problem down to our solution of a 15,000 city problem, that's a difference of a factor of 126. They're, they're both, by the way, are problems in Germany. Martin Groch had 120 cities in Germany, worth 15,000. So it's 126 times bigger. So the question is in uh, then, say, 24 more years, so in 2025, will we be able to solve a 1.9 million city TSP? Well, a few years ago, when we had solved a 13,000 city problem, I, I was giving lectures and I was just sort of shouting, well, what's going to stop us? Right? These methods can, can extend. But I regret it afterwards uh, doing that. I mean, it, it's a lot easier preaching than it is to actually do something about it. Um, and so in the past two years, I've aimed to try to identify, well, what do we need to do in order to, to get there? What steps need to be taken? And so to do that, I, I wanted to get a 1.9 million city problem. Well, I could have done like David Johnson, just taking a random problem, but that didn't seem so much fun. So I looked around on the internet to see where I could get a source of data. And I found a name server that's run by the U.S. government that they keep track of geographic, geographic names. I mean, the idea is that if somebody discovers something, for example, I, I was walking this Monday and there's this big river. I don't know if you guys know, there's a big river that goes through the campus. And I thought, well, the, the Cook River would, would be a good name for that. But if you send it to the U.S. government, they verify, no, no, that already has a name, that river. And so I went to that server and I asked them for all, every place in the world that has people. <laughs> and they came back with 1.9 million cities in the world. All right, so I posted this uh, about a year ago, a year or so, so ago, on, on the internet as a challenge to see, well, what can we do with this now? And Kjeld Helskin from Denmark took up the challenge and worked hard. We, we've been working together to try to get a very good tour. And we've used our, my three colleagues and I, we've used our Concord code to see what, uh, what kind of guarantee we could get for this tour. And what we have now is a guarantee that's down to uh, under two-tenths of a percent away from optimal. All right, now, I don't want to describe wh what these numbers mean. These are successive, uh, successively stronger algorithms we've applied that take more and more computation time. See, this whole run has taken about six months. Of, and this had to be done sequentially. And the reason is that these linear programming problems I mentioned, optimizing over these box, there's fantastic software available for that. The best code in the world it was developed by uh, our colleague, Bob Bixby, called Cplex. And it's, it's a commercial code, and it's very, very robust for solving problems. Right? These have millions of variables, these ones we're solving. But unfortunately, the problems are getting hard. They're taking a long time. So in terms of our total computer time, this is way over 99%. So it's not taking us very long to find these sides of the box we want to use. It's taking us long to get the best point again. All right, so right now, that's the bottleneck. If we're going to go any further, we've got to attack this. Now, and actually, that's a good thing. If the TSP, suppose we just had solved this problem, but we spent uh, six months of CPU time and we solved it, well, it would have been kind of fun, and, and David and I would have had T-shirts made up saying we're the champions or something. Uh, uh, but it really wouldn't have been all that important scientifically whether we could solve that problem or not. I mean, the important thing of the TSP is not, not, not these largest size problems. It's what mathematics is coming out of it. I mean, how is this stuff being applied elsewhere? 
there's many, many problems in optimization. We're, the IMA is running an entire year on optimization. It's, it affects many industries, this type of discrete optimization in particular. And the TSP has had profound influence in this area of developing methods that can be applied over and over again. And the TSP has had influence in all the areas that, I, that I've talked about today. So heuristic algorithms, many of the methods we take for granted for applying for heuristics were first developed for the TSP. This is the area of integer programming. This is the one where you have these points in space and you're trying to optimize over them. There's a very robust model in optimization. And again, the TSP has led the way in developing methods for this. And general computing. This idea of using the grid to the internet to do lots of computing. This is something that TSP has also been leading the way in doing. All right, but I said in the beginning that problems don't really catch on unless they have some nice tie with applications. So you may wonder, well, what application is there going to be for this 1.9 million cities? Well, if you look around the internet and you say, well, I want to find a world tour. Interestingly enough, the first page that you get is a tour that was made by none other than Robert Bixby in uh, 1950. But you see, uh, they, they, well, it, was a, it was a good tour. They, they went in 13 days, which is a lot better than 90. right? But there was, this wasn't visiting all the cities. You're just seeing how fast they could go around. So that's not, not a legitimate application. But, uh, but a newspaper reporter in Florida several years ago phoned us uh, and, and had a real application for the visiting all the world. And it happens every year. It's an important logistics problem. And that's uh, Santa Claus uh, <laughs> going around. So uh, any help we can give uh, Santa Claus in, in his pursuit is something we should certainly try to do. Thank you. Meyer is the Chief Scientific Officer of Solera Genomics. We're going to talk about the mathematics of genomics. And in June, we're going to have a talk by Charles Peston at the Karate Institute called Secrets of Life, Human Heart Revealed by Mathematics and Computer. I hope to see a lot of you there. I'd like to thank once again, Phil.